it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Angels dwell in Greenhaven Hospital. My job is to kill them. Beware, beware. There are things in the dark. They freeze your skin. They burn your bones. But if your dreams are worth going that far, find the morning star. She'll grant you one. Three wishes to the Lightbringer. Price and prize come in pairs. One is free, one is fair. On the third, you'll be hers. The old nursery rhyme repeated in my head as I washed my hands and face with an earnestness that bordered on fury. It was an old favourite around here, called Lucy's Song. It's from long before I started working here. The worst thing about it was how catchy it was. At the moment it was stuck in my head, and the last thing I wanted was to start a night shift through those old corridors while having a creepy tune about things in the dark as my background music. Things had been slowly spiralling out of control, and by then I'd found myself closer to a mental breakdown than I cared to admit. The pandemic had only made it worse, too, and when I looked in the mirror above the sink, my eyes were red. I looked like I'd been crying myself raw for a long while, but... Well, the truth was a lot less dramatic than that. Five minutes from then, I'd be awake for 33 hours straight. It was a new record in my terribly insomniac life, pulling all-nighters at the hospital. I'll preface this by saying I'm not a doctor. I'm part of the night shift security staff, and my job, similar to that of a glorified mall cop, is half doing rounds through the corridors and half just sitting in the security room watching the camera feed. As such, up until somewhat recently, I spent most of my work hours bored out of my mind, daydreaming of home and vacations with my fiancé. Work at Greenhaven Institute is a tad different from your usual hospital job. The security personnel are considered essential workers, but already we were labelled as such long before the pandemic hit. As things are now, we're pretty understaffed, and if they could legally keep me here on duty 24-7, I'm fairly sure they'd do that. As of right then, I still had one hour before my break ended, and I'd be clocking back in. With nothing better to do until then, I went to get a cup of tea and whatever meal my dysregulated biological clock fancied best. The break room is this tiny cafeteria that had been set aside when a larger eating space was added during the last time the building was renovated. Nowadays, it's only open for staff use. Due to the hour, I didn't expect to see anyone else around, I wasn't too surprised to see two other people behind the counter, picking things off the shelves and sliding something into the microwave. You don't need to fetch stuff for me. I'm not a kid anymore. No, but you are short. I snorted at the retort, catching the end of their conversation. Angie's eyes followed me as I walked towards them, puffing her cheeks and looking as miffed as I was amused. The coat of warm freckles crossing her nose made it look like she was sprinkled with cinnamon, clashing with the pale braid running down her back. Ah, uh, Marie Antoinette syndrome. It's when someone's hair suddenly turns white. Now, in myth, it's associated with extreme stress or trauma, but it actually tends to have other causes like immunological problems or nutrient deficiencies and the like. In Angie's case, though, I do think stress played a part in it. In contrast, her cousin Alex is all warm skin and friendly smiles, that faint Brazilian accent slipping into his speech as he greets me. Hey, Lord. Already working again? Uh, soon. My shift starts in an hour, I replied with a sigh, while turning the kettle on, and he handed me the mug with my name on it. Use of the break room equipment was one of the staff perks, and I chided them more times than I could count, but the truth is, as long as they didn't break anything, nobody noticed. Angie pushed a grilled cheese sandwich in my direction. I eat something solid too, jeez. The three of us sat by the window, but I made a point to ignore the figures standing in a circle on the patio outside. We were too high up for them to notice us anyway. My head hurt a little, and I wondered if I'd had enough time to take a nap. My phone told me I had 45 minutes before my next shift. If I slept now, I wouldn't be awake enough to work later. I sighed, pulled my mask down to eat, and told myself the only thing I heard outside was rain and wind whistling, 
and that I didn't see hints of a nun's garb in the middle of the strange congregation. Well, it's hard to swallow food nowadays. I've been too stressed and tired to build up an appetite. But Angie was right, and I knew it. Everyone has to eat. Lily wants to lower my dose of fentanyl. Alex mumbled between forkfuls of his microwave lasagna. Once being the key word here. It would be nice if it goes okay, but she doesn't get what chronic pain feels like. It doesn't just up and poof, there's nothing here. I glanced away from my sandwich, not really needing to ask what he was on about. You can smell them before you see them. Iron, smoke, and something burnt. The air grew colder as the angel approached until finally appearing behind the door. It looked like a broken doll, well, almost. Tall enough to need to bend over to walk in, in long tattered robes and pieces of what was once armour, now fused to its flesh. A single loop of bone protruded from behind its ears and circled around the head like a hollow crown. Ah, a Grigori. It approached our table with clunky steps, fingers the colour of aspen bark extended to inspect me. I tried not to frown at the smell, to not react at all, and ignore the noise of ceramic and metal grinding as it brought its face a tad too close to my own. I told myself I still had almost an hour, but its breath felt like cobwebs on my neck, hissing through the slits on its mask. Its old mottled tunic rustled against my side, leaving hints of frost on my uniform in the middle of May. I took in small, slow breaths and forced myself to chew my sandwich. Don't look. They won't hurt you if you don't react to them. I kept my face level and looked straight past the thing. To my left, Angie was breathing a little too hard, but looked deeply enthralled by my iPhone wallpaper. It worked. The angel gurgled something between bored or disappointed, and turned from us to Alex, who kept blissfully chewing his microwave meal like it was a heaven-sent ambrosia. Children wander, wander yonder, just come home, don't be afraid. Then it brought its own face closer again and grabbed Alex's neck. You're cooling my food, you dumbass pigeon. He flipped the fork in his grip and shoved it through the eye slits in the angel's mask to get it to back off. It reared backwards and half-turned, sharp nails leaving talon-like marks where they grabbed him. I feel kind of bad for him sometimes. There's something about him or some reason that the ignoring tactic just doesn't work. Well, the things around here must have some vendetta against him. The angel recovered from its surprised stupor and lunged forward again, trying to claw at his chest. Fork still sticking out of the eye hole. Laura, little hand here, please. I'm not on duty. Laura. I should still have twenty minutes before work. I haven't slept in over a day. I was so, so tired, but well, the angel didn't care. I groaned and stood up to help. Alex ran behind the counter, and Angie had started slamming everything atop our table against the creature's head wasn't looking hurt, but she was keeping it distracted enough to stop moving, which was helpful. I aimed my work baton at the back of his neck, where the armour didn't cover. Oh, it felt like hitting a tree, but it went down with a dull thud, then shifted around skittering like a centipede and tried to tackle me instead. Fine, I was getting ticked off enough by these things that punching one might actually make me feel better. I tackled it down in a one-arm chokehold or as best I could while squirming along with it on the ground, my other fist hitting it anywhere I could reach when I did my best impression of a rabid koala. The cold was starting to seep into my clothes enough to feel warm instead. Not good. Oof, hypothermia sucks. Get off! Alex came back holding Eddie's entire cheese knives collection between his fingers like some sort of gourmet ninja, I had barely enough time to roll off the angel before he lunged to stab it. It took longer than it should have for it to end. The angel still writhed on the floor, pinned down and so irreparably broken. A pair of cheese knives sunk into its chest and four more scattered on the floor with blades covered in the thing's blackish blood. Oh, I'm sorry, Eddie, my love. I think they may still be usable if you wash them. 
probably, but it just wouldn't stop talking. Silver spawn, fruit of the traitor, break, break, break you, bring father back. For all that was good and holy, this was a headache, literally. Its voice rang in my skull like a church bell. I felt almost relieved when Angie fetched a couple of serrated knives and we could just start sawing off the halo. The moment that loop of bone got fully detached, the thing just stopped and fell limp, like flipping off a switch. God, it creeps me out every time. But my taser doesn't work on any angel bigger than a cherub, and riddling them with holes just slows them down. Now, if you want them to die, the halo has to go. I wish there was an easier way. Um, guys, Angie whispered, peeking through the break room's exit and frowning. There are more down the hall. How many? Three. Oh, fuck. Alex added to our conversation. We made our way out very, very slowly. I pushed the brim of my glasses up, keeping my breathing as steady and silent as I could, and peeked out to check the area ahead. We repeated that course of action at every turn and intersection, at times hiding in one room or another for a few minutes while waiting for the area to clear. My job is to deal with those things, to keep the patients and visitors safe. Ideally, the security will be keeping the angels off the hospital altogether, even if the altogether usually excluded the morgue and the old wing. But with them already roaming the halls, and considering one had reached the break room of all places, the best course of action I could think of was to take Angie and her family with me to the security room, check the perimeter through the cameras, and then go wherever seemed safer. We could do a round through the apartment units, and cross the reception to reach the elevators, or get there in half the time taking a shortcut through the old wing at the back. I made a mental note of the lights flickering next to room 018, reminding myself to mention it next staff meeting. It should stay off or on, but not both at the same time. The old patio was as dark as expected, but the night was fresh when we reached that part of the building. My path was cleared by moonlight and the light of my torch climbing the walls. I hummed to calm my own nerves and made a point to not pay any attention to the group in a circle up ahead. There seemed to be more of them gathered there than usual too, but hard to say for sure. It's not like I ever counted them. Mercy. Half words reached my ears, but thankfully their backs blocked the view of what was causing the sound. When one figure detached from its little group, approaching me, I let my lantern focus past and reach the wall beyond it, my eyes following suit to the white gessel and tiles, still humming and intently not looking. Alex took the chance to sneak up ahead while the thing was distracted by inspecting me, and Angie followed suit. I had to endure the scrutiny until they reached the patio's opposite edge. Once again I tried to not frown at the smell, to not react when it came close and prodded around me. I took in small, slow breaths and forced myself to pay it no heed, keeping my face straight as I walked past the figure. I told myself I could not see the multitude of eyes staring behind its metal mask, that I could not see it or the circle of angels to the side, nor what they were eating. I told myself it was not Sister Bridget. I regrouped with Angie and Alex and we carried on. The angels didn't follow. I can understand why we're always understaffed here. I'm strong enough to choke hold a Grigori, but any higher ranks are tough to deal with. Just finding someone with the qualifications to survive the job is already hard, and a year ago I wouldn't have ever dreamed of one walking into the eating areas. But there's no point to keeping a record for this if no one else understands what I'm talking about. So, let's rewind things a bit. In my first memory of Greenhaven, I think I was about seven. I'm sure I was there before, since it's the only big hospital in town, and I was one of those Spitfire kids who couldn't spend a week without getting a new scratch or bruise from playing and falling around. But this is the first time I remember being there. I didn't fully understand what was going on, but I felt sick. I remember just sitting there, 
morose and playing with some toys while the doctor talked to my parents. And then he said a new word. I didn't really catch the weight or implications it would have in my life, but even back then I knew that was the name of the thing that made me feel so weak and nauseated that I couldn't play during breaks at school anymore, making my bones ache and not letting me sleep at night. It was a thing that made my dad pack our things into a big bag and move us to a room in the hospital, and what made my mum cry when she thought I wasn't looking, sobbing that she wasn't ready to stop being a mom. At that time, I didn't fear any monsters under the bed or crammed in the closet. Instead, my monster lived inside me, and it was called cancer. The patient in the room next to mine was a girl around my age. She had the largest honey-brown eyes, soft freckled cheeks, and bewilderingly light hair cascading down her shoulders. She was adorable and sweet, and the complete opposite of me. I thought I understood why the nurses called her Angie. Most of my time not spent in treatment or sleeping was filled by me and Angie sitting in the kids' play area, watching TV together or stacking Legos atop the low table. I met a princess yesterday, she said, whispering like she was telling me a secret. When she leaned over, the marks under her eyes seemed even darker than usual. Do you want to see her too? She's really pretty. I was there for chemo. Angie was there due to severe insomnia, coupled with crippling nightmares any time she did sleep. And by that point, she'd been there for two years. I didn't know how she hadn't gone crazy yet. Laurie, do you want to see her too? I can take you, she pressed. Princesses don't exist, I grumbled. Not like in stories. Dad says the Queen might visit if we live past a hundred, but a fairy tale princess wouldn't be here. I felt bad as soon as the words had left my mouth, and Angie's excited smile vanished. Well, in my defense, I was a child, and social skills were even less my forte then than they are nowadays. It's not a good defense, I know, but it is true. You think I'm lying? I mean, look, we are... Uh, I stammered, trying to fix my screw-up. But if fairy tales were real, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be sick. There'd be a witch to learn a spell from, or a hero who'd travel the world and bring a cure. My mum wouldn't be crying, and your mum would be here, and Barney would be a real dino. I'm not lying. I met her. She's magic. She granted me a wish, she cried. I don't quite remember the hours following that, other than agreeing to let her introduce me to this supposed magic princess she'd met. Half of me was sceptical, while the other half was wary. If she had met someone that wasn't family or the hospital staff, then who was it? In the back of my mind, I wondered if I should tell an adult, but in the front of my mind, I just wanted her to stop crying. By the time afternoon turned into evening, I'd all but forgotten about that earlier conversation and went to sleep, which may have been a mistake since it resulted in Angie coming into my room and waking me by belly flopping on me. The action expelled all the air from my lungs, so instead of screaming and waking anyone, I just made a weird, squeaky, toy-like noise. Lucky us, I guess. She pulled me by the hand, and we tiptoed down the hall. In technical terms, Greenhaven is a hospital and mental health research institute located in a rural area of Britain. But in practical terms, it's nestled at the rear of a tiny town in the middle of bloody nowhere. The complex is old, and it shows on the walls, with tall ceilings and vintage windows. While most of the facilities have been through reforms to match modern safety and technological standards, there are sections here and there that were just closed to the public and left to gather dust, mainly at the centre back of the hospital, which faces the town cemetery. And that's where Angie guided me to, still stopping at every intersection and carefully peeking in, before tittering and skipping ahead with me in tow. I didn't see the point of her doing it. No one had been around there in ages. No patients or hospital staff to sneak by. Our steps left little footprints and raised puffs of dust as we walked. Are we there yet? Almost. Come on. Quick. Quick. I never understood what Angie liked about this area, and it neighbouring a cemetery of all things didn't help. No matter how beautiful a garden, 
Any feel-good imagery had got spoiled for me when I spotted the dark iron gates and the old tombstones in the distance. Well, I guess I should be thankful she didn't drag me into the actual cemetery. Instead, we took the stairs down to the ground floor and turned left, heading towards a small patio. Angie let go of my hand when we got there. I took a moment to catch my breath, so I lost sight of her for a little bit. In the time it took me to get some air and look around, she'd already crossed half the patio ahead while running along the lights. Most of the hospital facilities were lit by fluorescent lamps during the evenings. In comparison, those around us here were very dim, silvery wisps, but I thought the little orbs on our way had been part of the illumination too, maybe some sort of emergency lights. My feeling of strangeness intensified when they started floating away, fluttering ahead of me. They eventually moved towards the figure of a white woman in a white tunic with lace trim, like a camisole my grandma might have worn, and wearing a wreath of dried flowers atop her long, long hair. From afar I thought she was a statue or mannequin of sorts, at least until she moved. Lucy! Hello, Angelica. Good evening, the woman greeted, Arms rising to catch Angie as she dove in for a hug. Now, oh, when I say this lady was white, I don't mean Caucasian. I mean white like plaster, porcelain or wax, without a single tint of pink or any fleshy hue. I could almost hear a clink of china when she moved. Her eyes were so pale they seemed made of glass, and her voice half came from her lips and half chimed in my head like an echo. And it made me a tad dazed. Well, I agreed with Angie on one thing, however. In this strange, unearthly way, she was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. Oh, I see you've brought a friend with you. She chuckled as Angie nodded without leaving the hug, latched onto her dress. I stood in my spot a few meters behind, frozen in place and gulping as the woman turned her attention to me. Uh, hello, I stuttered. Hello, little one. I swallowed the urge to inform her I was not littled and still growing. Here, here, I promise I won't bite. Now I swear, by then my parents had properly stuffed the whole stranger danger thing into my head already, and I was also old enough to not just run towards some random person I didn't know. But well, that's exactly what I did. I don't know why. There was something about her, about that calm, soothing voice and this fairy-like lady, the colour of moonlight, just sitting in the garden. I walked straight up to her with an outstretched hand. She inspected my face up close, her hand light under my chin. I remember thinking her fingers were a little cold. What's your name? Laurel. That's a pretty name. Nice to meet you, Laurel. She smiled. So, what can I do for you? Um, what? Child, no one comes to me for no reason anymore. There must be something that you want. What is it? Well, that sounded depressing, to be honest. But I didn't tell her that. Um, can I ask for anything? She nodded. Hmm, anything? Angie giggled from her seat on the pale woman's lap, eagerly waiting to hear my wish as well. I thought of asking to be pretty, like a princess, to be rich with all the new toys and candy I could ever want, to be healthy and not live in a hospital anymore. But maybe I needed to be reasonable, you know, ask for something small. So I asked for something to help me when the pain and nausea weren't letting me sleep. She sung me a lullaby, Lucy's song, her song. The lines she sung were different from the ones I knew, and it didn't sound creepy when she was the one singing it. Just quiet and a little sad. I can faintly recall something wet dripping down my cheeks as I closed my eyes, and my still-dazed brain wondered if a drizzle had started or if I was crying. It might disappoint you, but my first encounter with the inhuman didn't include ritual sacrifices, sulfur or hellfire. When I opened my eyes again, it was the following morning. I'd woken up on my hospital bed, feeling well and more rested than I had in a long while. 
Angie was somehow also on my bed, draped over my belly and snoring peacefully. Well, the second wish I made was after my father died. Heart attack. It was sudden. It wasn't even sick that we knew of. Well, his death hurt more than the cancer. I got along well with both my parents, but I'd always been daddy's little girl. He was the stay-at-home parent while my mum was out working, the one who always arrived first in my room when I was little and had nightmares, the one who pushed the couches around and built blanket forts, and even as I entered my teen years, he was the one who picked me up from school and made lame jokes on the ride home. So there I was, sixteen and grieving and terribly depressed, humming myself to sleep every night because all I could do otherwise was cry. And that's when I had the thought of visiting Angie. Well, in hindsight, I feel bad about it. Ever since I'd been declared cancer-free, I hadn't seen Angie even once. I hadn't even added her on Facebook. Well, it's not like we had a fight or anything, it's just... Well, that hospital had taken over a year of my life. I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. I was fine. I was free. But she wasn't. Angie was still tethered to Greenhaven, and she might be for the rest of her life. So in an immature and quite frankly cruel decision, I walked away and abandoned her. But there was something from that time that I didn't leave behind. My wish. The song the pale woman had given me. Even then I carried it with me through the evenings, helping me fall asleep and rest when the pain of my loss was too great. It never failed. And now, now, I wanted more. Part 2 Take the time you need, sweetheart. I'll be right here. It was with equal amounts of hope and shame that I left my mum's car and stepped towards the hospital. Mum didn't get out with me, but also didn't drive away. She brought a book to read while waiting in the car park. I think she wanted to give me some space and such. It was a nice thing, but it still made me feel so alone, entering those huge old walls all by myself. Just reaching the reception desk to ask about Angie was a chore in itself. There was a group from the church nearby that had come over, and they were clogging the lobby. It was one of those charity events where they gathered the sick kids and put up some movie for them to watch. They did that sometimes when I was a patient myself, and it gave me well, conflicting feelings. Fond memories of old Reverend Joseph bringing giant bowls of biscuits and other things he baked himself, and Sister Bridget smacking the back of my head because I was eating too much or laughing too loud. Laurie! A voice made me turn on my heels to spot a girl running towards me. She was taller now and thinner, but I'd recognize those freckles and whitish hair anywhere. Laurie, that's you, right? It's me, over here. The receptionist was taking a while to find Angie's file, so having Angie herself appear was a relief. I think my mum called to tell that I was coming beforehand. I don't remember what we talked of once we got past the initial greetings. It was awkward, waves of anxiety and regret crashing in the back of my mind. But she just seemed so happy to see me. It was nice, and a double guilt trip too. I wasn't sure how to ask her what I'd come for, either. One doesn't just go, Hey, I've not seen you in years, but I just came to meet the devil, right? And so the result was we just stood there for a while, laughing like the little girls we once were, at the same time catching up and talking of nothing at all. This is a hospital. For what reason are you cackling in the middle of the hall? I glanced over my shoulder to see who had spoken. A woman in a nun's garb, who could be anywhere between 40 and 60 years old, looking at me with a sour expression. Sister Bridget, for sure. Oh, she looked even more of a grumpy prune than when I'd last seen her. Yes, you with the weird blue hair. Why do you even have that colour on? What would your parents think? I didn't respond. My hair was none of her business, and I'd actually been pretty proud of it. I'm talking to you, Miss... Green, the receptionist informed, then shrunk in her seat a little when I glared at her. Come on, Laurie, let's get out of here. Angie eye-rolled at Bridget, pulling me away from the lobby to go somewhere else to chat in peace, like the cafeteria or her room. In some weird display of her lack of common sense, the old nun reacted to the teenagers ignoring her by raising her voice even more. 
Miss Green, come back here this very moment. This is unacceptable. Miss Green. With the way she was shouting, people were turning to look, and even some started following after us. It was like we'd stolen something from her. Well, looking at things from an outside perspective, Sister Bridget wasn't evil, but she was never a pleasant person either. We really didn't want to deal with her, so we switched from walking into outright running. Down the stairs, one floor, another, until there were no more floors to climb down. Laurie, I think we shouldn't... <laughs> Angie gasped. Her voice was almost a whisper now. We shouldn't be here. I stopped and looked around. I couldn't recall being in this area before. This part of the hospital wasn't the old ring, but had very few people. I think I saw one doctor, just the tip of a white coat slipping out of sight at the end of the corridor, but that was it. It was so quiet the air conditioning felt boomingly loud. Where are we? It's the morgue, Angie frowned. Remember when we were in my room, and if we looked through the window, we sometimes saw people bringing in gurneys. When they came here. Of course I remembered. It was different from someone being brought to the ER. The ambulance lights were never on. No paramedics rushing with orders. No IVs and no tubes. No rush. Just gurneys, body bags, and quiet. I also wasn't super fond of the idea of being around a bunch of dead people. The issue was, besides the air conditioning, I could still hear the sound of Bridget's posse looking for us, calling us over. Without thinking, I pulled Angie with me through the closest set of doors. The voices of the church group sounded muffled through it, first closer and closer, and then fading as they went further down the hall. Angie stiffened, and I let go of her wrist, thinking I might be gripping her too hard before I realized what she was actually looking at. The back wall was filled with built-in metal drawers, and I had to shove away the mental image of corpses contained there. In the surroundings, there were shelves with tools and chemicals, a trash bin and a couple of electronic devices. But the stars at the center of the room were the two bodies lying atop metal tables, light hovering above them. We're trespassing. He was not like the old wing, okay? They'll catch us. Come on, Angie whispered. It was so beautiful. Warm, golden light, like suns in miniature. One wavered for an instant, then darted upwards and through the ceiling like a reverse shooting star. I wondered what it was, where it went, if the other one was going to vanish too. But it just floated there. I stared, mesmerized by the golden orb. I was about to step closer when a shadow shifted in my peripherals. Someone, no, something moving. My eyes caught a wispy ash grey cloak and armour that may once have been beautiful but was now rusty and half molten against flesh, up to the mask face of a three metre tall monstrosity. Its feet dragged towards the light, breathing quite eerily, giving it the appearance of a tortured dog. It reached towards the light and smiled, too sharp a grin with too many teeth. And then I saw the body on the table move, face twisting in terror and pain. Help, he mouthed, a shaky pleading hand twitching in my direction. The creature turned towards me as well, extending a hand that looked deader and greyer than the body's own. I thought fight or flight should kick in at times like this, but it didn't for me. I just froze in place, frost burning my shoulder in the shape of its fingertips, my mind not quite following what was going on. Angie was pulling me away, or trying to, and I couldn't move. Disinfectant and formalin were the strongest scents I could notice around, but there was something from it, like an unpleasant afternote, that made my nose wrinkle. My gag reflex kicked in once my brain managed to sort out what it was. Mildew and rot. Smoke and iron. Burnt flesh. Laurie! Angie pulled me through the doors. I barely got past the threshold and heard it close when my legs gave in and I slid to the floor, shaking and puking in a full panic fit. Are you okay? Angie asked. 
concern laced into her voice while she crouched down, sitting on her own ankles and placing her hand on my shoulder. But other than being worried for me, she didn't seem scared. Couldn't she see that thing? Couldn't she smell it? Monster. <laughs> Angie, there was... Didn't you see that? Ah. Oh. She blinked and then grinned, as if she'd just realized what I was talking about and got excited. Yeah, that's an angel. Sometimes they pop up when there's something dead or dying. Well, it's pretty creepy, but it's okay, though. They're pretty dumb, too. Just ignore them and they leave you alone. It burned me, Angie. It was so cold. It burned. Well, um, yeah, but not anything worse. She averted her eyes, voice fading slightly. I'm not crazy. I recalled then the time we were smaller and walking through the old areas. The way Angie stopped at every corner, peeking out even if there was no one around. How she stepped so lightly it didn't make a sound. The antsy quip in her voice calling me to come quickly. They pop up when someone's dead or dying. He is not like the old wing. It's not just close to a place where the dead stay. It is the place the dead stay. Don't look. Don't linger. They'll catch us. Well, she wasn't excited because I was scared, or because that thing had hurt me. It was because the fact I could see them too meant she wasn't insane. When she was the one scared or hurt, I'd believe her. I'd not drug her to sleep when there were monsters hovering close like the nurses did. And when I thought of that, I couldn't feel angry anymore. Once my legs stopped shaking, I stood up and walked as quietly as I could manage, letting Angie guide me like when we were younger. I finally told her about my dad and having a new wish. She led me three floors up, stopping in front of a dark ebony doorway. The door itself was nothing like I remembered, but the metal number right above it was familiar. The same she'd been living in since the last time I saw her. She said that Lucy wasn't at Greenhaven, so if I wanted to see her... We should go pay her a visit. How did you even meet her to begin with? Well, I misspelled Santa as Satan on a Christmas letter. She giggled. I don't think every kid that does that meets her, but, but I really wanted someone to talk to who believed me. I mean, anyone would do. I don't remember the exact day Angie started babbling to me about meeting a magic princess back when we were little. But it was winter. Here we go. She pushed the door open didn't lead to the hospital bedroom that I expected, but instead to a long, dark hallway stretching for longer than it should, and another open doorway in the distance, the barest hint of a staircase visible behind it. She took out a torch from her pocket and turned it on, and I entered after her. Our steps echoed when we walked in. The stairs seemed to go on forever, down and down and down, until at some point I realized we were no longer descending, but going up instead. Did you ask for anything after that? Yeah, a family. You know, better than the one I had. And she didn't have the best parents. They weren't abusive or anything, they just weren't there. I don't think I'd ever seen them. When she became ill, she was left under the care of the medical staff, out of sight, out of mind. She didn't get better, so she only had me. And then one day, suddenly, Alex was around. A cross-cousin thrice removed or something like that transferred all the way from Latin America. Angie had been exploding with joy when she introduced us, and she stayed all bubbly for weeks, even though she never mentioned having a cousin before that. Well, it made sense now. We emerged at a huge, multi-floored indoor garden. A silver sky stretched above our heads, beyond a tall greenhouse ceiling, rain pattering gently on the glass pane. In the morning glow, I took a while to notice the lights fluttering around us. The same wispy things I'd seen at the patio before. Some of them had faint human outlines, and the second that thought came to me, there were people all around us. Keepers and gardeners tending to the plants. They said that Lucy's office was on the top floor. Oh, great. More stairs, I heaved. Yep, stairs all the way. Angie cackled at my plane. As many as we need to. Tamiya won't take more, and you know what Verin did last time they had to babysit. That's too many still. 
just until more housing is built. Be nice. The door was ajar, but Angie knocked anyway. The chatter inside paused and a come in resounded after a second or two. Grandmas would be pleased with that office. Plush couches, embroidered cushions and little puff seats. A coffee table with doilies and a tea set with side servings of biscuits, toast and jam. Thick carpet covered the floor and lacy curtains adorned the windows. It looked like a tea room with Victorian furniture. Lucy was sitting across the table, staring honey into her tea and talking to a man who was lying down on the same couch. Without the inherent strangeness of the night and the glow of wispy ghosts surrounding her, she seemed so normal now, almost human. Too bad I'd already seen too much to believe that. Angie rushed inside, and I almost expected her to dive onto Lucy's lap like when we were kids, except there was already someone else on the couch occupying that spot. Um, good morning. Hello, Laurel, she smiled. It's been a while. Do you like sweets? I wondered how she'd recognize me. Clearly I didn't need to introduce myself again, but did I need permission to sit down? Angie didn't. She plopped onto a puff seat and proceeded to gobble up biscuits, showing her middle finger to the man with his head on Lucy's lap. And he returned the greeting by showing her the finger too. Aren't you way too big to act like little kids? Welcome to my life. They're always like this. Lucy chuckled. What did you come for this time? Um, I have another wish, deal, well, something to ask. Yes, of course, but what is it that you want exactly? I, um, it might be weird. Is there a wish she can make that'll make her happy forever? Angie piped in. <sighs> I doubt it, she sighed, and I had the feeling she'd replied to us both. You all have similar wishes, starting with basic needs, water, food and shelter, but then most turn greedy, fame, riches, beauty, to live forever or someone's death. I tried to keep you all happy for ages, but you've played The Sims and you know that some sim always sets the house on fire. Well, the game nailed it. I gave you whole cities, just take your pick. 99% are now in flames, <laughs> go figure. She gestured to the windows and the strange buildings beyond them. Nowadays I only watch over my own home and whoever I take a liking to, but some of you still reach out to me on your own, so when that happens I try to at least listen. There are batshit psychos, but there are candid requests too, like you and Alex. What about him? Angie cut her off, pointing at the guy sprawled on her lap. He lifted his head just enough to glare at us with all the seething scorn of a cat who's been mildly bothered before turning around to nap. He asked for me. For you to do what? Me? Oh. The corner of her lips rose in a wry smile. What can I say? I think he appreciated the spunk. A heart for a heart. Something like that. Can you stop talking like I'm not here? The catman grumbled and got the finger from Angie once more. I was speechless, torn between the day's earlier events, the grief of my father's loss, and the implication that someone had wished to shag the devil. Strange things happen on this godforsaken earth. Well, I'd have probably just kept sitting there for a lot longer if more people hadn't barged upstairs, making a ruckus all the way in. What in the law's name is this place? Be gone. Be gone. Be gone. <sighs> what the hell's wrong with you, hag? My mind registered the clerical attires even before I realized that this was Sister Bridget, Father Joseph, and a younger nun with blonde hair that I didn't know the name of marching into the room. Bridget had one of those hardback Bibles with a cross on the cover, and I'd not be surprised if she'd been smacking people with it which also explained the choir of swearing and curses still going on outside. Be go- Stop. This is my home and you were not invited. The room and exploded in colours and ice, lights in violet and blue and green and a thousand hues that didn't even have names. 
Bright, so bright. Spikes forming on the ceiling, a frost on the windows. Air left my mouth in a single white puff. Cold, cold, hot. My eyes burned. Something wet dripped from them, from my ears and mouth and nose. I smelled iron. Breathing hurt. Dove, your guests are still here. A man's voice sounded from behind me. I blinked rapidly, just enough to see the shape of a person walking towards Lucy. Then the chill and the lights faded and she rushed back to where I was. My sight was wonky in this newly found bleeding haze. Too knitted up close and catching so many little details, it was painful to focus, while things far away were little more than blobs. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh dear, you're so fragile. I felt a handkerchief tapping my face. Most of those here have got some tolerance already. Oh, I'm sorry, is it hurting? Blinked, blinked, blinked. Past the red in the corners of my sight was a flare of wings. For just a second and then gone from view along with the unnatural chill. Something akin to frosted glass making layers upon layers of sharp feathers. The top so white they almost glowed. At the bottom was black, or it was coated in black. That same deep tar I'd seen angels bleed, part dried and part dripping and disappearing onto the carpets. Drip, drip. That must hurt too. She paused for a second and let out a hollow chuckle, bringing me back to sit by the couch with my friend. Andy had a nosebleed that she was stanching with her own sleeve, but otherwise she seemed fine, at least compared to me. The sudden brightness and ice were gone, and the room's lazy daylight tried to warm my frostbitten cheeks. From what she told me later, though, the trespassing trio was much worse for wear, and had as much blood leaking from all their orifices on their heads as I had, but with no one to wipe it off. Poor old Father Joseph seemed to be in the middle of a panic attack, gripping his rosary and mouth opening and closing without making a sound. Bridget was grappling her Bible while mumbling something that sounded like ten psalms fused into one, and the blonde nun had fallen on her knees and was now covering her face with both hands and whimpering. All three frozen to their spots. Well then, it's been a while since I've last had to introduce myself. She cleared her throat. Hello, it's nice to meet you. I'm Lucifer. Satan! the priest gasped. If we're going to use nicknames, I prefer Lucy. Satan sounds rude when you say it. So, are you hungry? A few moments passed and there was no response. Only Joseph and Bridget still standing with their respective crucifixes, like some sort of strange church show. Lucifer let out a long, deep sigh. Really? Crosses? The way she strained that word made me uncomfortable. What in that poor boy's life made you think he liked crosses? Seriously? My eyelids kept closing shut. I felt cloth tapping my cheeks dry again and slightly cold lips pressing against my temple. The burning sensation lessened a little and I risked cracking an eye open for longer than a blink. In my squinty, near-sighted point of view, it took me a moment to understand Bridget had crept closer until she was already right behind and whacking the Bible on the side of Lucifer's skull. And judging by the fact she didn't even flinch, that was as good as nothing. Well, almost. The wreath of dried flour she'd always wore came apart, pieces falling like sad confetti and exposing a pair of horns, not on her forehead but raising in a slight curve from behind her ear. My dad had had a favourite teacup, where well, the wing was broken with the middle of the loop gone and the remaining tips jutting out into jagged edges. Mum had been telling Dad to throw it away. It had been forever, but he never did. And that's what those horns reminded me of. Broken china, with a sharp emptiness in between. That wreath was a gift, she said in the same calm tone as always, it took me a second to realise she was now holding Sister Bridget by the neck and off the ground. I've tolerated when you stupid, tantrum-prone, bleach-drinkers screw yourselves over and blame me. But next time you raise a hand to me or mine, I'll hurt you. 
Am I clear? Sister Bridget flailed her legs in the air. Was I clear? She repeated, this time a little slower. Yeah, yeah. She started, then coughed, and Lucifer let go. Bridget fell on her backside, and there she stayed, coughing more and scampering backwards. Good. Now what do you want? Choose your words carefully. It's, don't get close. Get away from me. You, you have no claim over us. Be gone. Lucifer sighed, exasperation so thick one could almost drink it. Deal. Shape shifted in my peripherals, behind the wet redness in my view. I'd let myself relax, but the strange movement made me snap an eye open again almost immediately, despite the disorienting disconnect it caused. It was like the room had been cut in half. Through my open eye I saw the wintry morning light still trickling through the windows, dainty curtains waving with a breeze, and the furniture Angie and I had been interacting with stood around us couches and chairs, and the little vintage coffee table. And then, through my closed eyelid, the office just... ended. Beyond it was night. I could see Sister Bridget and the blonde nun in the corridor that led to the old patio of Greenhaven. Tiled floors with a dust haze that covered everything like the shroud of a long time past, undisturbed except for our old footprints. The blonde finally stumbled back to her feet and ran towards the front part of the hospital as fast as she could, tearing cobwebs and out-of-service tape, leaving Bridget alone. Distant footsteps echoed down the opposite side of the hallway, with nothing to clear the night penumbra besides the newer wings lighting coming through a door the other woman had left cracked open. What the... Bridget seemed to be about to spout some colourful word choices, but cut herself short. Instead, she took a couple of deep breaths, massaged her forehead, and her hand came out bloody. She stood up slowly. Christ, I must have hit my head. That sounds about right, she mumbled, using the wall to steady herself. From the way she kept looking around, confused and dizzy, she couldn't really see us. She seemed smaller than I remembered. No longer a straight and imposing figure, she faced the faint steps echoing down the hall. Miss Green, I can hear you. You're trespassing in an unauthorized area. Stop bumbling in the dark and come out already. Miss Green. Step. 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 Reverend, is that you there? Reverend Joseph was safe, just traumatized, in my side of the room. The unnamed man had had half a mind to pull him back when Bridget tried to bonk Lucy in the head, and now the old priest sat on a puff seat, shaking like an iPhone set to vibrate and asking where his female colleagues had gone, while Angie handed him some food. So the steps weren't him. Bridget's scream cut off before leaving her throat, and there was something heavy slamming down. I saw hints of ashen cloaks, faces with too many eyes and mouths with too many teeth, before a dozen hands grasped from the dark, pulling her in. Oh, the sounds they made. My God, the sounds. I barely noticed someone trying to get my attention, ushering me towards the snacks. Don't watch. But I did. I watched the things atop the shape of Bridget, her voice barely a whimper when one straddled her form, hands going into her chest and reaching at something deeper than the ribcage. But I saw no blood. Golden light pulled out from the wound. I watched this glow be swallowed and the creature be bathed in a ring of gold, swirling throughout its crown like a hallowed sun, beautiful and filled with the divine essence whence it came from. For only a second, and then it wavered, and the light flickered and faded like a dying lamp the gold turning to rust and tar with wisps of smoke. The angel wept, arms rising to clutch its tainted halo and crying in a voice that carried more sadness and pain than any human could comprehend. It cried and cried until another creature, another angel, pushed it off the old nun and took its place to also drink from the golden glow. That one also came alight and faded and wept and the next one too as the angels swarmed her like a flock of deranged crows. Holy crap, Law! 
said don't watch. And Angie shook me by the shoulders. I gasped, both of my eyes now wide open. The office tea room flooded fully back into view, and the old patio vanished from my sight. Better now? Yeah, I guess. What were they doing? Trying to feel whole. Lucy frowned. We were more attuned to our father than your kind. When we fell, a part of us was torn away. She took a deep breath. Father had named me Lucifer, the Lightbringer. Even crippled, I still had my own light to fall back to, but most of my siblings didn't. And so they want hers. Even if they hurt her? Souls are infinite. They can be torn but not destroyed, so they don't see what they're doing is wrong. Why don't you just give them souls? Then they'd leave us alone. Ah, if it were that easy. She mused, pushing a teacup into my hands. Tweaking father's rules is simple. Get consent from his creation. Give something, take something. Then it's fair. But I can't create new souls. So, uh, our first deal. What did you take from me? Effort. She smiled softly. You went through all that trouble to meet an old, tired lady for such a small wish. That was enough. So that's why the first wish is free. It isn't, not really. But as long as you're not too greedy, it'll feel that way. If she told the truth and that nursery rhyme contained the rules for how these deals work, then the following wish I'd made would be fair, at least in theory. Now, she spoke after the half eternity it took me to finish my tea. What did you come to ask me? My dad died. Can you, um, can you bring him back to life? She looked at me for the longest two seconds of my life before shaking her head. Why? My dad isn't you. You can't bring people back. I can, within limits. Then do it. I paused and amended. Please? He's already gone. I cannot find those who have gone unless the soul in question calls for me. She sighed, her fingers wiping my tears again. When a medic tries to resuscitate someone, they have a time frame to work with, too. After that, not all the CPR and fancy equipment in the world can do anything. Do you understand? And it was like my heart was crushed to a pulp and pooled at the bottom of my stomach. I just went through a conga line of trauma just to get to that room and ask the devil herself to bring my father back. And even she couldn't do it. Well, to the rational part of me, it made sense. But for the most part, I just knew my dad was gone and I felt so very helpless. I didn't know how Angie could have lived like that as long as she did. I sure couldn't. I clenched my eyes and wept clutching the hem of Lucifer's sleeve, the lace wrinkling within my fists. She smelled like earth, greenery and dew, the way a garden smells after rain, and I tasted something bitter mixed with the tears and snot running down my face. And I wished, I wished, I was strong enough. It's been almost ten years now. I've not seen Lucy ever since, but whether it was due to my second wish or not, Greenhaven kept a hold on me. I kept visiting Angie, more scared of leaving her alone again than I was scared of facing the angels. By the time I finished college, there were more people who could see those monstrosities as well, and they were hiring security personnel specialised in dealing with that. And that brings us back to the issue of having a horde of soulless, soul-eating angels roaming through the hospital. Their numbers have increased since last year, and their ranks are getting worse. Up to 2019, I'd be very unlucky to bump into more than a couple of cherubs per week, and maybe one Grigori per month. Nowadays, crossing Greenhaven's corridors feels like being a death row inmate taking their last steps. There are at least a dozen low-rank angels roaming about at all times, and there was one in the patio group with Bridget that I could swear is either a choir or a fury. Well, I can beat a Grigori, sure, but I'll be damned if I have to face a fury without backup. Oh, we're hiding now in the security room. I'm writing this down while checking the feed for when the angels leave the hallway, 
or at least clear it enough for us to make a dash for Angie's doorway. I prefer to be calling for help, but the radio isn't working. Maybe the cold earlier did a number on it, and Angie totaled my phone by smashing it on the Grigori's head. Also, Alex won't shut up about Angel's ruining his lasagna, and it's driving me insane. Dan, the twenty pounds I owed you are under the notebook. Eddie, sorry, I don't think I'll be home for dinner. I know it's our anniversary, and I love you. I really wish I could come home. Everyone, I can't apologize to you enough. But there are more and more of these things roaming the corridors, and more and more bodies filling up the morgue. I don't think I can make it back, and we're running out of time. So, I'm going to make my third wish. This is, um, Edward, or Eddie, if you will. Laurel disappeared three weeks ago. The police are investigating, and they're considering a kidnapping since her car's still in the parking spot. Though, that's difficult to imagine. Laurel was quiet, but she was as tall as a guy and stronger than most guys. Now, I can't picture her being dragged off without putting up a fight. Another possibility is she had a mental breakdown and run away. I'm afraid they might decide that's the case. Well, I've um, transcribed all of Laurel's notes here. It doesn't really feel like she's gone, but maybe that's what denial feels like. The last day she was around, she greeted everyone as usual and then went to get some tea. By the time my shift started, no one could get in touch with her. Even her things had disappeared. Her trinkets on her desk, her spare uniform. Everything gone except for Dan's twenty quid and the notebook we found in the security room. Just left on the chair like it was waiting for us. Oh, the police don't believe those notes. They think it's at best the work of an aspiring writer, or at worst a register of hallucinations. But it's real. It's not the first time people here mention seeing something shifting through the halls, or meeting a girl with whitish hair asking them for something, and as soon as they turn a hallway or blink, she's disappeared. We just never had an account this detailed of her before. The authorities stumped. Maybe that's why I resorted to posting it all here, in case someone has an idea of what to do. If you've seen my fiancé or know anything that might be related, please get in touch. Her full name is Laurel A. Green. I miss her so bloody much. Oh, my big teddy Laurie. Well, I think we should start compiling a set of rules to follow to stay safe. Like I've seen in other stories of strange places. But I don't even know where to start. The lighting on 018 still flickers, but only if you're alone when you walk by. Sometimes the elevators show numbers to floors that shouldn't exist, and the stairs go on longer than they should. But more rarely, strange lights appear in the corner of our eyes, like dots in the distance waiting to be followed. And there are shadows too, sometimes. I pray nobody's stupid enough to follow those. And last, well, there's that nursery rhyme. It's been around for ages. Sometimes we find ourselves humming it at random. Sometimes I can swear I'm hearing Laurel singing it. Beware, beware, there are things in the dark. They freeze your skin and burn your bones. But if your dreams are worth going that far, find the morning star. She'll grant you one. Tiptoe through where the angels are. Discard the gold of the empty throne. If secrets are scary, if the truth scars, here's a light on your way downstairs. Three wishes to the light bringer. Price and prize come in pairs. One is free, one is fair. On the third, you'll be hers. So a really weird and wonderful one there for you this evening. What do you think of that one? Well, anything that's got the devil in it is a winner as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that one certainly did. Yeah, so, um, whew, all right, another week gone. These weeks are flying by July already. Can you believe it? Well, that's it for me for this evening, but I've got a few good things lined up. I might even be back again tomorrow night. Not sure, but definitely something for you on Sunday evening, and then Monday back to the regular schedule. So, um, keep tuned. Hope you enjoyed the podcast last night. Um, that seems to be getting more and more popular every week it goes by. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> well, that's enough for me for one week. Hope you enjoyed this week's stories. Back again tomorrow or Sunday. Till then, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.